A very good morning to you and welcome to News Center. My name is Fatheya Mohamed Noor. We have a very interesting conversation in studio today. We're talking about postpartum hemorrhage. And it's said actually to be one of the biggest causes, or rather the biggest cause of maternal death in the country. In studio, I'm joined by Dr. Kireki Omanwa. He's the president of Kenya Obstetrical and Gynecological Society. Thank you so much for making time. Thank you very much for inviting me to the studio today. Right. Like I had said, you know, um, postpartum hemorrhage is said to be one of the biggest uh, maternal death causes Absolutely. in Kenya. Absolutely. How would you define what postpartum hemorrhage is? Okay, postpartum, you see, when a, when a woman delivers, right. there is what we call the placenta. And the placenta is what connects the baby to the mother. So once the baby has been delivered, this placenta has to come out. When it c comes out, there is a limited amount of um, bleeding that occurs. Mm -hmm. Remember that a womb which uh, is not carrying a baby is about, about the size of my arm, my hand, eh? mm -hmm. about 140, 150 uh, grams. But you see, this is a structure which has grown to accommodate a baby, uh, let's say about 3 kilos, 3.5, sometimes even bigger. Mm -hmm. And apart from that, that womb also carries fluid where the baby lives, and it also carries the placenta and so on. So it is stretched to a, to a, certain, to a certain limit. So when that placenta comes out, there is a little bit of um, bleeding, about 100, 200, 300 milliliters. Mm -hmm. And then after that, there is a mechanism which basically starts, uh, starts uh, contracting the uterus, uh, squeezing the arteries that pass through such, such that they block. You remember, in order for that baby to survive in the womb, there has to be blood which passes from the mother through the placenta, through the cord to the baby. So that's how the baby gets some um, nutrition and some waste products also pa pass um, that way and into the, uh, the mother system. So when that contraction is not there and the womb which was stretched does not contract, it leads to excessive bleeding. Mm -hmm. And when you talk about uh, excessive bleeding, here we are talking about a loss of blood of about 500 milliliters or more. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, sometimes women lose about one liter, 1.5 liters, or even two liters, and this actually leads to, uh, to death, unfortunately. Right. Why do you think this is the case in the country? Is it that we don't have enough, you know, um, resources to take care of women when it comes to this particular? A very good question. But uh, I'll take you a little bit back a little bit. When you talk about uh, maternal mortality rates, um, uh, Kenya, unfortunately, is not doing very well. Our maternal mortality rate is about 364 uh, women in every 100,000 women who deliver in a year. Mm -hmm. So if we say that uh, there are 1 million deliveries, we're actually losing 3,640 women. So Ooh. today, right. so if we break it down um, um, uh, so that it's a little bit clearer, yeah. if it's 3,600, let's say, for, let's say 4,000 women, just for, for our, um, our discussion, mm -hmm. it means that uh, every month we lose about 3, 360 women. Every month. It's a very big number. So in a day, mm -hmm. so we divide 360 by 30. So we have about, um, about 12 women yeah. every day. So as we are discussing today, by the end of the day, 12 women will have died in this country. Oh. A, a very big number. Yeah. Now, um, uh, what are some of the causes of um, maternal mortality rates? We have what we call the big five. Mm -hmm. And the first one is actually... PPH, that is postpartum hemorrhage. Mm -hmm. The second one is what you call preeclampsia or ecl and endeclampsia, mm -hmm. basically where you have um, the blood pressure increasing uh, during pregnancy, especially after the, the 20th week. And this can secondarily also lead to postpartum, postpartum hemorrhage. Mm -hmm. The third one is sepsis. The fourth one is um, 
post-abortion complications right. and then the fifth one is um, what you call obstructed labor mm -hmm. so these are the big five that kill our women but the number one that kills most of them is about uh, is um, uh, is PPH yeah. which accounts to, for about anywhere between 30 to even 60 percent mm -hmm. of um, maternal mortality rates mm -hmm. you ask your question why do we have such high numbers yeah. of um, maternal mortality rates I think the question is um, multi multi pronged there are different reasons for that um, the first reason could be lack of awareness that the mothers who are carrying um, uh, these babies and especially who have predisposing factors for example they are carrying um, twins a uh, third uterus is extremely stretched may have a problem in contracting when they have delivered mm -hmm. women who have fibroids for example and we know that um, African women women of African origin mm -hmm. have a 30 even up to 60 percent um, uh, chance of having fibroids in their reproductive period and mm -hmm. um, remember when a woman who has fibroids carries a pregnancy this fibroids are going to grow with the pregnancy. Why? Mm -hmm. Simply because of their huge amount of blood that flows into the womb and they will also take advantage of this and they will also grow. Mm -hmm. And remember that she has to deliver. And when she delivers, unfortunately, the uterus will not contract the way it is supposed, um, it is supposed to contract. Mm -hmm. You may have a large amount of fluid in the, in, the, uh, in the uterus such that when this lady delivers may not actually uh, contract properly leading um, uh, to PPH. You may have also an issue with sepsis, for example, and that is because um, if we start inducing a patient and uh, she uh, has, for example, the waters have broken mm -hmm. and she takes time to come to hospital, there is a chance that there can be what you call upward infection right. uh, into the womb and this, of course, will lead to, um, uh, to PPH. Something which we rarely talk about and which I really want to uh, emphasize on yeah. is anemia. Mm -hmm. And what is anemia? Anemia is basically uh, a situation whereby the amount of blood is reduced, the level of blood is reduced in the system mm -hmm. uh, in a very, uh, in a very uh, layman's language. So what happens is that uh, these patients who have anemia, yeah. when they come to deliver, if they come with um, you know, uh, severe anemia, even a little loss of about 100 millimeters will be a shock um, uh, to the system. Right. And there are also other, 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 other reasons mm -hmm. um, why women, uh, why we may have postpartum hemorrhage. That placenta that I talked about, yeah. usually it is situated in what you call the anterior wall or what you call the posterior wall or what you call the fundus. But sometimes it can be in front of the baby and it covers the opening, what you call the cervix, mm -hmm. and it covers the opening completely. This one is also prone to, um, uh, to PPH when they deliver. Sometimes that placenta center can dislodge itself either a small piece of it or even a large piece of it can also be dislodged mm -hmm. and this releases um, different proteins into the uh, into the system mm -hmm. and can also lead to um, uh, to PPH we have also cases of um, where a patient has had surgery for example um, has had removal of fibroids before she becomes pregnant and during delivery, she may have what you call a rupture, and that rupture, if it is not sorted out, and the patient is not um, uh, is not taken to theatre uh, as an emergency, can lead to huge amounts. Um, it can lead to PPH and even to death. Right. Now, these are the predisposing factors. Mm -hmm. uh, so, awareness of the patient is very, very important. Mm -hmm. We need to know now what happens in the hospital. Mm -hmm. In the hospital, we have a situation whereby there are some certain things which must be there in order for us to be able to sort out these patients who have who have PPH. Number one is um, you have to have the personnel, mm -hmm. qualified personnel, mm -hmm. people who know and can identify and can actually act on these cases as quickly as possible. Mm -hmm. We have counties, for example, where you only have one or two consultant obstetricians and gynecologists. Right. So if you have two obstetricians in a county, um, uh, I mean, they are absolutely overwhelmed. Why is that the case? Is it that there's, there are no facilities or people are not going to school for it? Or what, what really is the issue when it comes to that? I think the, it's multi... 
it's multifaceted as well. Right. Um, number one, you may have issues whereby if I'm going to work, then I also need to get satisfaction from that work that I'm doing. Mm -hmm. I'm going out there in order to help uh, women deliver safely such, such that these mothers can go home with their children. But when you get there, you find that, uh, number one, the equipment, equipment may not be available. Mm -hmm. uh, you may not have drugs which are, uh, which are needed. You may not have blood, which is a very, very important pillar mm -hmm. in uh, the management of PPH. And notabene, while you're talking about blood, yeah. um, Kenya collects about 265,000 units of blood, which is about 60% of what we need as a nation. Mm -hmm. We need about uh, half a million liters of blood in a year. And also, yeah. of these 260,000 uh, units that we collect, 70% um, uh, of it is used by women. So it is imperative that we have blood wherever women uh, deliver. Or if not um, in the same place, then mm -hmm. access to this very, very important uh, uh, commodity uh, should, be, should be made you know, um, uh, available. Mm -hmm. So we have issues of training. We don't have enough people who want to go in the far-flung areas where um, they are going to live. And even if we do have, like now we have um, several thousand doctors who are unemployed. We have nurses who are unemployed. But unfortunately, it's paradoxical that Kenya is a country which is um, a third world, I don't know, really third world, so, but developing country, <laughs> um, developing country. Yeah. We are actually exporting. Um, health mm -hmm. workers right. and uh, we ourselves um, don't have enough to take care of our needs mm -hmm. which is which I think is um, is, is, a, is a bit is a bit of a challenge mm -hmm. um, so we're exporting uh, healthcare workers we don't have enough um, we may not have enough uh, medications which are needed or the medications that we have are not actually quality medications. Why am I saying this? There was yeah. a study which was done by our one of our uh, our seniors. Um, it was a multi-center study done in different countries in Kenya, Tanzania, South Africa, and um, and I think Uganda, if I'm not wrong. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that we, they did find out is that the medications that we use, some of the medications that we use, are actually fake number one mm -hmm. and number two whatever is written on the package that this medication has x milligrams or grams of um of a particular uh, component was actually a lot less mm -hmm. so imagine that i am trying to help a patient who has pph and i give her this medication mm -hmm. which is either fake or does not have enough of the component mm -hmm. that it is said to have. What will happen is that she will not respond and unfortunately I'm, I'm going to lose this patient. Mm -hmm. So the other aspect is that um, we don't have enough ICU centers because when these patients lose one liter, one and a half liters of blood, two liters of blood, they must be supported. They must be taken to an ICU, um, uh, uh, ICU um, uh, ward where they will be taken care of. We do not have enough of those ICUs. We may have a building, but mm -hmm. we may not have equipment. Right. We may have a building with equipment, but we may not have manpower. Mm -hmm. We may have a building with equipment, with manpower, not have, but doesn't have um, medications, doesn't have, you know, components like blood. Mm -hmm. So all these have to work together in order for us to, to save these, these women. Is it accurate to say then that uh, this PPH is more likely to happen during a C-section? Uh, compared to like a normal birth or like a natural birth? No. It can happen either in um, um, a natural delivery setting mm -hmm. as well as in, um, uh, in a caesarean section setting as well. Mm -hmm. You see, so long as a woman has or a patient has those predisposing factors, we should think ahead. We should be proactive and say, this patient has come and um, she has a, a history, for example, of previous PPH. Mm -hmm. So what do we do? We have to work in an anticipatory manner in order to help her, in, or, in order for her to be able to go home with her baby. Right. I want us to take this story and then we'll come back to the conversation. Mm -hmm. Now, for a long time, Kenya has been operating without laws on surrogacy and assisted reproductive health matters. And of course, this is like I in IVF. Suba North MP Emilio Diambo is reintroducing the bill the Assisted Reproductive Technology Bill 2022 and the Family Reproductive Health Care Bill to be debated in Parliament. 
Now, if enacted, the bill should see the country have a solid framework on how women facing infertility challenges get help and comprehensive sex education among the adolescents. Beldin Waleola with more. Right, of course, we'll come back to that story in just a bit. Let's just continue with our conversation, Dr. Kirera, of course, very interesting on PPH. Now, what is the importance of uh, blood that when just a small amount uh, is lost, it can lead to death? Absolutely, it can. Now, you see, we have about six liters of blood in the body. So um, this is what, is what is optimal. So when you lose 500 milliliters, mm -hmm. or when you lose one liter of blood, the body starts um, responding uh, to this loss. Uh, there is what you call homeostasis, meaning that the optimal function of the body um, in a particular in a particular situation. Right. So what happens when um, uh, you lose when a patient loses such a, um, a large amount of blood? What happens? The heart starts pumping a lot faster. Mm -hmm. Uh, in order to compensate for the loss, um, uh, the, uh, your blood pressure, because this, even if the heart is pumping as much as it should, um, this blood is escaping from other, other, uh, uh, other areas, mm -hmm. from tears, for example, in the vagina, from tears um, uh, in the cervix, from um, um, vessels which have not con um, constricted in order to stop this loss of blood and so on. Mm -hmm. So the blood pressure starts decreasing. And when the blood pressure starts decreasing, what happens is that there is what we call centralization of blood. So the body automatically starts sending blood to the very important organs, meaning your brain and, mm -hmm. um, and your heart, your, your liver, and, um, uh, and the kidneys. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, what happens when, this ha when uh, there is centralization of blood? Um, your, um, your, your, the other organs start becoming cold because there is no proper blood supply. That's where you find a patient saying, I'm feeling cold, they start having, they start sweating, right. and uh, it gets to a place where now the kidneys are not um, cleaning the blood as they should because you remember there's a reduced amount of blood, so the waste products in the mm -hmm. system start accumulating. The knock on effect is that um, may have acute kidney injury or acute kidney failure, you may have liver failure as well, and you find such a patient starting to have, you know getting confused mm -hmm. and then unfortunately the next step is getting into a coma mm -hmm. and when they do get into a coma unfortunately you can have also brain injury what we call um, hypo hypoxic ischemia meaning because there is no enough blood supply and no enough oxygen so the, the the brain is not getting what it does and so it has brain injury so you have a set of you know, events mm -hmm. which, um, even if we manage to reverse them, yeah. because we can reverse the, the kidney injury, if it has not progressed too far, mm -hmm. we cannot or you may not be able to reverse brain injury completely. Mm -hmm. So you may find, yes, uh, this woman has survived, the baby is there, for example, but she has uh, injury which may not, may not be reversible, mm -hmm. so she becomes quote-unquote a vegetable. It's pretty dangerous, really, when you talk about it that way. Um, is there any preventative measure in terms of, especially when for pregnant women, to avoid that to happen? Absolutely. I think the first thing which we need to really, really emphasize on is um, when a woman does get pregnant, she needs to go and see her doctor. Mm -hmm. She needs to go to hospital. According to uh, WHO, um, a pregnant woman should have at least eight contacts with her, uh, with her doctor. This may not be very possible in some, sp in some places, mm -hmm. but what we advocate for, even if we have four contacts, that would be fantastic. Obviously, mm -hmm. um, as somebody, somebody, somebody said, uh, our dreams are valid. Yeah. And we, 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 <laughs> want, we want our patients to have those eight contacts. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, the first thing is that once you have realized that um, your period, you missed your period, and you think that you are expectant, mm -hmm. please make, um, make, make, make headway and go to your nearest health center, mm -hmm. you know, the hospitals. With the devolution now, we have quite a number of health centers. Mm -hmm. 
we have hospitals you know from level two all the way to referral hospitals where these um, uh, these patients can be seen we need to check their hb the amount of blood that they have remember i talked about anemia mm -hmm. this is something which i think as a society and um, more so as the kenyan obstetrical and gynecological society we are advocating for such that we must know at the inception at the beginning of pregnancy what is what is the state of anemia in this patient mm -hmm. because this plays a huge role in the whole spectrum of pregnancy how the baby is going to develop in the delivery and if there are going to be any complications mm -hmm. so this is important this will be one of the big big um, steps in order to sort of um, mm -hmm. uh, sort of work prophylactically against PPH so visit your doctor um, uh, uh, regularly yeah. and the doctor of course is going to check your blood pressure mm -hmm. is going to check the weight and now that we are going to have um, uh, community health volunteers or community health workers um, they need also to be trained in order to pick out you know some of these symptoms and signs which can later on um, uh, lead to to uh, such a dramatic um, mm -hmm. uh, a turn of events yeah. and these patients need to be referred as soon as soon as possible mm -hmm. so that regular checkup will actually help us to get these patients who may be actually be prone uh, mm. uh, to PPH. PPH. Now I want to ask, as uh, the president of the Kenya Obstetrical and Gynecology, uh, Gynecological Society, yes. what are you doing you know, to reduce the number of people losing their lives, women losing their lives to PPH? <laughs> that is a trick question. But <laughs> is it? I just want to know what you're actually doing on the ground. Um, yeah. uh, yes. Now, um, actually what we are doing right now yeah. is uh, one of the things that um, the Kenyan Obstetrical and Gynecological Society is doing we are um, advocating that is why I'm um, as the president of Cox I decided that this month we are going to talk about PPH create awareness let mm -hmm. people know what PPH uh, what PPH is all about who knows we may need to extend this a little bit um, in order to uh, spread the message around um, as far as possible so advocacy is one of the things that um, that we are doing secondly we have put in place a team of um, of doctors and not only doctors but also other um, uh, people who are uh, active in this space and uh, what we want to do is want to make this not a one-off or a um, one month but we want to make it something which is continuous such that people will know whatever it is uh, they Mm -hmm. When they see what PPH is, when they hear what is PPH, they know that this is actually postpartum hemorrhage and what needs to be done. Mm -hmm. And this message needs to percolate right down from, um, from where we are seated mm -hmm. as the Kenyan Obstetrical and Gynecological Society, mm -hmm. right down to the grassroots and then right up as, um, um, as the government um, promptly, uh, aptly has said, it is a uh, bottoms up as it were wow. so this message needs to go down so that it can also come up again so advocacy in uh, including people who are in, uh, people and not only people but um, organizations who are interested and are working in this space very very important and then we also government must be here because we can't do um, uh, these things alone mm -hmm. as a society we are more of advocates and that is why we are advocating for this but now the implementation mm -hmm. how it is to be done because uh, cogs cannot buy medications mm -hmm. cogs cannot employ doctors Cogs cannot, you know, do so many other things. So what we can do is to work together. We as a professional society, we know where our members are. We know what they can do. When the other entities come in, uh, the government comes in and uh, provides the medication and, um, and so on, we can be able to work together in order to, um, uh, to help these women. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing is um, uh, creating awareness amongst the pregnant women yeah. that um, now that you are pregnant, these are the things, these are the steps which you need to do. Mm -hmm. So this is what Cox can do. And as an advocacy uh, and um, uh, advocacy and a professional society, we want to make this the centerpiece of, um, of, um, uh, of Cox because these are preventable things. Yeah. We are coming close to 2030. Right. And uh, Kenya is a signatory to um, you know to different um, different um, uh, uh, entities. For example, we have um, uh, the development. Uh, 
mm -hmm. SDG. Yes. Uh, SDG, one of, the, one of the pillars of SDGs is actually reduction mm -hmm. of maternal mortality rates. Yes. Um, in 2030, as per the SDG goal, I think it's 3 or 3.1, yeah. we are supposed to have reduced our maternal mortality rates from 364 to 70. Oh. We are just around the, we are just around the corner. <laughs> right. 2030 is just around the corner. Yeah. But there are things which we can do which can actually help in accelerating. We may not get to 70, but even if we reduced this maternal mortality rate from 364, even if it reduced to 150, it would be still a huge, huge step. So this mm -hmm. is what we are working on. Finally, you know, my question was to get back to the government yes. uh, discussion. What do you think the government needs to do? Any policies to make sure that by 2030, actually, the number has actually dropped? Um, there is the, I think it was the Abidjan Declaration, mm -hmm. which was, I think, in 2015, mm -hmm. that um, um, in every year, uh, systematically, the GDP, the amount of money allocated um, to the health, uh, to the health sector was supposed to increase until it reaches about 15% of the GDP. We mm. are not yet there. But we have made steps. Um, uh, I think that something else which needs to be done by the government, remember we have a devolved you know, system of governance, the national government, government which is basically in charge of policy and the, uh, and the county governments which are basically in charge of um, uh, implementation. Mm -hmm. So number one, we need to work together. We need to be on the same page when it comes to um, maternal mortality rates. We need to work in tandem with the uh, with the societies mm -hmm. professional societies because remember yeah. when this when we lose these mothers there are very high chances that the babies are also going to be lost so we want to work with all the organizations well, kenyan obstetrical and gynecological society kenyan pediatric association and the government's different arms of, of government that is number one mm -hmm. uh, number two what i think should be done um the health budget must be ring fenced in the sense that X amount of money has gone to the budget and in this budget we have um, Y amount of money which is for reproductive health, let it be used for reproductive health and reproductive health only. Mm -hmm. Because you see when this money goes into one pot and then uh, you have um, uh, things which you need to pay salaries, you need to build roads for example and so on, you may find that the, some of this money actually goes to where uh, it is used in a way uh, which will not help us in terms of um, mm -hmm. in terms of health. So if we can ring fence this um, this um, uh, uh, these allocations, that will be a very very good way. Number three, mm -hmm. we need to employ um, health workers because um, as i said in the beginning it's paradoxical we have uh, doctors we have nurses midwives who are unemployed unfathomable mm -hmm. and incomprehensible mm -hmm. in uh, in a developing country so um we need to employ this because um once we have this then we can actually go back and say that we are actually fulfilling what the constitution says that it is a guarantee of health care highest quality of health care including and reproductive health is the only one which is actually mentioned in the constitution mm -hmm. including reproductive health so um, employing uh, reproductive health um, 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 uh, oh, workers yes. mm -hmm. to be deployed into the various places various mm -hmm. places especially where where there is a lack of that number four uh, we need to get quality medication and here, of course, there is the pharmacy and the poisons board, which needs to come on board and be very strict about what comes in. Better still, maybe invest more in production here mm -hmm. instead of, of um, importing all the medications that mm -hmm. we get. Number five, right. um, we need blood. We Very need key. blood mm -hmm. because sometimes without blood, there is nothing you can do. We can give all these medications so that the heart keeps on pumping, but the heart can't pump empty on empty so we need blood so we need these uh, uh, blood transfusion centers to be available in all uh, in all counties we need to have icus mm -hmm. icus which are functional mm -hmm. not just a building not just a building with uh, equipment but a building with equipment with human resource 
Again, we come back to healthcare workers. Yeah. We need um, experienced people, uh, anesthetists who work in ICU, and, um, and and who can take care of these um, of, of these patients. So, mm -hmm. we have a lot of work to do as a government and also yeah. as professional society. You've outlined it very well, but I want us to go back to that story that I was talking about earlier. Yes. Where for a long time Kenya has been operating without laws on surrogacy and assisted reproductive health matters, like in IV in vitro fertilization. Now, Suba North MP Emilio Diambo is reintroducing the bill, the Assistive, Assisted Reproductive Technology Bill 2022 and the Family Reproductive Health Care Bill to, de to be debated in Parliament. Now, if enacted, the bill should see the country have a solid framework on women, how women facing infertility challenges get help and comprehensive sex education among the adolescents. Eldin Waleula with more. The Assisted Reproductive Technology Bill 2022 and the Family Reproductive Health Care Bill 2022 are not new bills to the floor of Parliament. After failed attempts, Suba North Member of Parliament Mili Othiambo is ready to see the bills this time round ascended to law. The second bill deals with the support of women who are struggling, women and men who are struggling to have children naturally and the Assisted Reproductive Health bill seeks to help them uh, using medical uh, systems to get uh, to get their children the other reproductive health care bill is a bill that deals with the reproductive issues that affect both men and women it takes a life cycle approach meaning it looks at the entire spectrum of life our reproductive life through the assisted reproductive technology bill Millie says men and women who are struggling to have children or have reproductive challenges will have the ability to leverage available technology as the country will have enough laws and framework to guide them but then what happens you take a stranger they take the child for you and then they refuse to hand over the child after the birth they refuse to hand over the child. There is no law. Yeah, uh, first of all, now you are going to the next level. Here I'm a kata, so you are adopting what now I'm a kata. You know, to Shida, this LGBTQ thing, it has made so many good laws even die when they shouldn't. And the church will be up in arms, or when it is a social adoption or a social arrangement, then we'll have gay parents having surrogates to carry their children. We must get somewhere that we don't, in our advocacy, we make it very clear that it is not touching. Because that is one issue in the 12th parliament that contributed a bit of the contention when it shouldn't exist. The Assisted Reproductive Health Bill will look at an array of issues not limited to IVF, egg donation, sperm donation, embryo rights, surrogacy, rights of donors, and the child born out of the assisted reproductive technology. We have women who are also facing similar challenges, including menopausal issues, but because they have not been dealt with in the law, we are not able to address them. Unfortunately, and I want to encourage our religious leaders that whenever you hear about reproduction, it is not about abortion. It is about the entire spectrum of reproductive life. In a meeting with the stakeholders that included non-governmental organizations like Kaelin, the Cradle, IPAS, members of parliament and senators, the integrities of the bill was discussed and how to better improve the clauses that saw the bill not sell through in the previous attempts. We actually introduced an amendment to the Births and Deaths Registration Act uh, to essentially give a notice to the registrar that surrogates should be recognized, intended parents should be recognized. The Family Reproductive Health Care Bill has been vouched to be key when it comes to reducing teenage pregnancies, pregnancy terminations, and even maternal deaths. The bill has provisions ensuring all women of reproductive age that is between 12 years to 49 years have access to reproductive education and information, have access to quality reproductive health facilities, Teenagers have access to adolescent-friendly health care services and facilities. The reproductive health care of men and intersex persons has also been extensively been covered in the bill. 
afya ya uzazi inaanza ukiwa mtoto na haiishi mpaka ukakufa hata wakati unafika mahali umeacha umefika kuwezi kuzaa bado afya yako inaendelea True education should not be an issue that you be left to the country or rather to the government to deal with it is not uh, an issue that should be left entirely to the church to deal with Belden waliula Ketia News There by Beldin on reproductive health. Just coming back to you, Dr. Ki Reiki, what are your thoughts on that story? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, this is uh, we have to applaud um, um, Honorable Mili mm -hmm. uh, Odiambo for what he has done. And um, I must say that I've also been part of um, the teams that have actually come up with this, um, this ART bill. We have, um, as a society, we have. Um, uh, interacted with this bill we have um, our inputs into this bill and um, something which I want to point out is that can you imagine a country for example with our on our traffic roads without any regulation mm, what chaos. would happen yeah. absolute chaos mm -hmm. even if an accident happened um, uh, there are no rules which govern who is right or who is wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, there, are no, there will be no rules to say this is what should happen if an accident, um, if an accident occurs. Um, I would be driving on the left-hand side, on the right-hand side, and, and it would not matter. Yeah. So I think these are the chaos which we, um, as a society, and what um, uh, Honorable Mili Odiambo is trying to do, to bring some order, or even to sort of um, stop this disorder from occurring, because it's going to occur. Yeah. Um, if you have a space whereby I can practically do anything about, um, uh, about IVF, and there is nothing you can do to me, mm -hmm. in that I can do this, and you can't take me to court, or even if you take me to court, there will be no act, there will be no law that I'll have broken. So the only law that I'll have broken is that of the conscious and of ethics that um, this, is, this is what is supposed to be done. But remember, ethics is also situational. So what he's trying to do is something which must be applauded and should be applauded, mm -hmm. and she has our full support. Put it, put it another, another example, for example. Mm -hmm. You find um, there are, I deal with um, infertility patients and, uh, on an everyday basis. And that is why I'm also passionate about this bill going through. You find patients who may not be able to carry a baby because of different reasons. Um, health reasons, they've had surgery, uh, serious surgery, brain surgery, heart surgery, where we cannot, uh, they may not be able to carry this pregnancy to term. Mm -hmm. Or sometimes there are some who are born like that, they don't have a womb. Or they have miscarried so many times, such that we know there is a problem with her system, with her body. Um, let somebody else carry uh, the baby for, uh, for, this, for this couple. Mm -hmm. And um, Somebody carries the baby for you or yeah. for this for this patient. Um, at the end of the day, when you she has um, surrogate has delivered, you have to adopt your own baby. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? It does not make sense at all. Yeah. And then, according to the law as it is today, this, this the surrogate is actually the mother of this um, of this baby until you have to go to court to get a court order in order to reverse this such that your name now can actually appear on the birth certificate mm -hmm. so such that this baby is actually legally yours so mm -hmm. i think these these are bottlenecks which need to be sorted out because it is imperative and then and, and the constitution is very clear that uh, we have a right you know to health and so on mm -hmm. these couples also have a right to have a family and to enjoy and to enjoy the products thereof. Right, I think we've had a very interesting conversation. Thank you so much. That is Dr. Kireki Omanwe. He is the president of Kenya Obstetrical and Gynecological Society. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me to the studio. Right. Now, in his recent trips to the coast,